Hello, folks, and thank you for joining me for today's reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. This will be the 29th book reading, and this will be titled Determining Recognition by Harry W. Bundy, the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Colorado. On St. John's Day, June 24, 1717, 241 years ago, the Freemasons of London formed a Grand Lodge and started the system of organized masonry which has spread over the entire world. And its law has become to be recognized by the craft masonry as the criterion by which the regularity may be determined. Freemasonry was up to that time a system of guilds composed of workers in stone to which honorary or accepted members had begun to attach a certain philosophy taught by symbolism based on the working tools of the operative masons. Then, as now, the basic hope of man was for an afterlife existence. Instinctively, he turned to the suggestion offered to him in the story of the plants, which may only live again by passing through the period of a deep sleep as we humans call death. The legend of the third degree was devised, and it held forth to every mason the fulfillment of that hope for himself which could only be gained by suffering from those calamities to which flesh is hair, air, and conquering the evils and temptations of this life, thus deserving and winning the right to resurrection pictured in the raising to the sublime degree of a master mason. Okay. Right there tells you that uh, this is an I this is their basic ideology behind their whole thing. Okay, and it's it's the uh, the whole larger picture is known as apotheosis, believing that their uh, efforts in this life will take them to immortality, and the things that they can do that they have to go through this suffering and this. Uh, 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 deprivation and and uh, all that you know uh, from suffering etc this is an ideology created ideology this is not necessarily what this life is about but this is their ideology and it is totally adverse to any true Christian ideology of which Christ paid the price and you do not get into heaven or receive eternal life through your works okay so and we'll carry forth from there every rite of Freemasonry eventually recognized this fundamental value of this lesson and adopted it in some form in some of its degrees ceremonial rites offering certain privileges to the Mason who successfully passed through the ceremony of raising gradually became degrees themselves and as the multiplicity of these ceremonies became cumbersome new rites or assemblies of degrees were formed in Britain, as might be expected, this became what is known today as the York Rite, always bearing true faith and allegiance to the Grand Lodge from which it sprang. Spreading over on to the continent of Europe and into the France, into France, the idea of another rite embracing the floating degrees resulted in the rite of perfection, which seized upon the idea of progression in knowledge and symbolism and subordinated the craft degrees to a progression of degrees and teachings taught by the 25th degree. What more natural than to develop the thought that the higher the number, the higher the power of those possessing the highest degree? Thus, we have the gradual departure of the Latin masonry from the fundamentals of the Anglo-Saxon masonry. Nordic masons soon saw the loyalty and cohesiveness of the Masonic influence and adopted a strange system which combined adherence to the Christian religion and influence of the Templar background of the masons of Central and Northern Europe, the submissiveness of the trades union or guild member, and the out of autocracy of the Grand Master. Thus, the Scandinavian Rite was established with the King of Sweden as Solomon, the Grand Master. The Rite of Memphis, with over a hundred degrees, was organized in Italy, 
and based its authority on the Egyptian influence of Freemasonry as practiced in Egypt and brought unto Rome by the practice of the Roman emperors of making philosophers and religionists of all types most welcome in the Eternal City and thereby building an influence which could be used as a personal loyalty when needed to further ambition. Thus Italy welcomed the smooth-tongued, plausible, and capable, though crafty impostor Cagliostro. Uh, this man recognized the desire for more light and led those who were groping for the light down pathways which called them far from the fundamentals of masonry as originally established. Now let us deal with Latin America. Latin masonry followed the adventures into South America and with it the inclination to yield precedence to the hand which held the scepter of authority. The thirty-third degree of the Scottish Rite masonry became the official or ruling degree by natural sequence. This lasted well over a hundred years. In the meantime, the Rite of Perfection had come to the shores of the newly created United States of America. The Latin influence and the religious domination over the minds of men caused seven degrees to be added to the thirty-third became and, and the thirty-third became the ruling or governing degree of the newly created Scottish Rite. In this English-speaking, English-thinking country, there was an inevitable clash with the hierarchical as contrasted with the democratic system of government and masonry. The compromises of the Constitutional Convention, where each of the newly formed states yielded some personal privilege for the universal harmony of the entire country, had taught the Americans the necessity of having a common cause and objective and the newly formed successor to the right of perfection, the ancient and accepted Scottish right, except, uh, accepted the historic right of the craft masonry to rule and govern, and gracefully recognized the priority of right held by the Grand Lodges. The newly formed Grand Lodges themselves declared their sovereignty over the lodges operating in each state of this new country, and added to that a principle known as the American Doctrine of Exclusive Jurisdiction which in effect said that the first group to form a Grand Lodge in any territory not previously governed by a Grand Lodge should be the only regular Masonic authority in that jurisdiction and all others not yielding allegiance would be declared clandestine. This brought a howl of protest from our Latin American brothers at first, but soon seeing the advantages of such a system in maintaining regularity, the Latins started changing their system of government in masonry to an acknowledged and grand lodge system of government by the Master Mason degree instead of the 33rd. In October 1921, a convention of the International Masonic Service Associations was held in Geneva, Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland. Um... Uh, sorry, at, the, at which a system of determining regularity was adopted. Naturally, the English system governed and the seven tests were set by which regularity could be measured. This has become the measure of regularity the world over. These are, number one, that it was regularly established by three or more recognized lodges or legalized by one or more recognized grand lodges. Two, that it is independent and self-governing and exercises supreme and exclusive jurisdiction. Now, all these are very important people. Listen up. That it limits, number three, that it limits membership to men believing in SAO or SOTO, S-A-O-T-O, and the obligated the, on the book of the sacred law recognized by the initiate. Four, that it requires the display of the three great lights in every lodge at work. Five, that it bars controversial political and religious questions from its lodges. And, a, that it, and number six, that it is founded upon and adheres to the ancient landmarks, customs, and usages of the craft. And seven, that it does not maintain fraternal intercourse with bodies which violate these principles. Let it be noted that the religion and politics are forbidden as a matter of discussion in a regular lodge. The participation of women is forbidden. Racial lines are supposedly eradicated. This last step has been often referred to by Mason and Profane alike as the tie that has held the British Empire together. 
the doctrine of exclusive jurisdiction has been adopted by all North American Grand Lodges and has resulted in the lodges formed among Negro Americans, Black Americans, they being branded irregular and clandestine and have been deprived of the privilege of regular membership by the use of the ballot in individual lodges. Now, of course, this was written, you know, back before uh, the civil rights movement of the uh, of the modern era, and uh, so some of this has changed. And uh, you can actually find uh, that the blacks have their own lodges, uh, Masonic lodges, but they're still uh, held under these principles and laws. Uh, those are just the higher class that get into that because they see the advantages of being tied in with this system. Because this is the true system. This is why I'm reading this. This is the true system that makes that rules your world. It's not the laws. You think. These are the laws. This is the jurisdiction that matters. This, this is why these people are running everything. And I'll continue. The use of the ballot is a landmark and must be used to protect the peace and harmony of the fraternity socially, intellectually, religiously, politically, and influentially. It may be well said that the ballot should not be used to determine physical qualifications such as color, but what of the doctrine of the perfect youth, which bars the non-male, the mentally impaired, the crippled, and the underaged? And uh, that is another thing about the lodge. If, you, if you're handicapped in any way or something, you have no place in the lodge. They want full and whole, complete uh, people uh, for maximum uh, production. This landmark is almost universally acknowledged and used to benefit the craft. We find many modifications in our Mother Grand Lodge. We find the Lewis system, which allows a youth of 18 to become a member in the lodge of his father, attaining to full membership at manhood. This system is copied in many of the Latin Grand Lodges. American lodges have forbidden the practice and have substituted encouragement, if not actual sponsorship, of the Order of De Molay for boys budding into manhood. The Equal Rights Program of the American States made it natural that the question of sex be modified in masonry, and the OES was devised for women, the Order of the Rainbow, and the Order of uh, Job's Daughters for girls. And of course, uh, nowadays they have the, um, um, oh, what is it that the women are in? <laughs> My mind just drew a blank. Uh, it's not the Shriners, but it's like the Shriners. I, I can't think of it right now. But anyway, they have a whole order for the women, especially too. Um. Again, this is long before the equal rights and and feminism and all that was when this was written. This is just the foundations. This is the literal foundations of the whole thing. The Equal Rights Program of the American States made it natural that the question of sex be modified in masonry, so the OAS was divided uh, for the Order of the Rainbow and the Order of Job's Daughters for Girls. These female and juvenile orders being builded on fundamental principles known as Masonic seem to have satisfied the de desires of the members of these groups and to have persevered the adult male character of masonry. So to, to pacify them, in other words, they created their separate groups for them so they could feel included. And so where the ostrich likes stupidity, this necessity for modification of a centuries-old way of thinking has been ignored. We find clandestine, clandestine flourishing, co-masonry embracing both men and women, and snobbery destroying the harmony which is the strength and support of regular masonry. We are reminded of the conflict fascistly fascist, fascist, uh, quoted when new rules for automobiles entering the traffic were made necessary and a realignment of the rights of autoists and pedestrians alike were necessary. Whatever, that's a hell of an analogy to go into all of a sudden. Anyway, he was right, dead right as he sped along, but he's just as dead as if he'd been wrong.
<laughs> That's freaking hilarious. Masonry should modify its rules to meet the challenge of education, of equal political standing for both sexes and all races, religious and political faiths. This should be done while there is a choice of speed, of method, and of goals, rather than hysterical cataclysmic upsetting of the pitcher of the cooling water, which will refresh and strengthen us all if judiciously used on a basis of share and share alike according to our needs. We should have a common religious faith, too, often glibly referred to as a belief in the grand architect of the universe. We should not have the absolutism of the Scandinavian or the eclectic system confining its members to Christianity, the intolerance of the Roman system with the primary purpose of preserving a ruling hierarchy, the fanaticism of the Muslim promising physical rewards for earthly mortality, or the liberal liberality of the agnostic, who, heavenly in his desire to please all, allows the aesthetic non-believer to crawl under the tent of masonry, as is so woefully exemplified by the Grand Orient of France and its adherents. We should make deity truly the point within the circle around the perimeter of which is room for every sect or opinion which acknowledges the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. To get down to the everyday fundamental with which we come in contact, should we use the hoodwink in initiations? One great jurisdiction has practiced, practically discarded it. Now you see, also I want to back up two spaces for a second let me take a drink before my coffee gets cold, totally cold here but um you notice now earlier they said they have no room for religion okay but yet they make it quite clear that you have to believe in the grand architect or a god they don't specify which god because they're leading you to their god actually but that's beside the point not part of this um the point I'm trying to make here is that they do, the Masons, these people, they separate religion from actual spirituality or belief or relation with God. I just wanted to point that out so you know that, that you know the whole point of this is they see where these people are coming from in their state of mind. To those who don't know and then to those that are involved in Masonry, the whole point I made the channel, of course, is to show you that you can't follow Christ and be a Mason. You could be a Christian and be a Mason, but you can't follow Christ and be a Mason. <clears throat> so, on I go. Um, to get down to the everyday fundamental for which we come in contact, should we use the hoodwink in initiations? One great jurisdiction has practically discarded it, using it only as we use the door of preparation room between the profane and the accepted petitioner. Discarding the hoodwink as we open the door, when we the, when we answer the raps of the candidate, it is highly successful. Should we dispense with the physical portrayal of the legend and rely on the mental application of the allegory? Many jurisdictions have done so under the pressure of caution and the necessity for bringing degree teams back from the amusement category of teaching to the solemn purpose of teaching by allegory. So a lot of lodges, they don't even do the uh, whole hooded ritual and all that anymore, even at this time that this was written back when. So that's why you get a lot of Blue Lodge members nowadays, and, and you show them these rituals and stuff that these are recreated by the uh, deeper uh, degrees, and they don't have a clue. What, they, they don't even believe it. They're like, that's not the Freemasonry I got into, you know. <laughs> Um, so should we demand that, uh, require a petitioner to associate him, that, uh, jurisdictional lines which required petitioner to associate himself with a group in which he has little of common interest, socially, financially, politically, religiously, or intellectually, a process which almost guarantees his early withdrawal to the class of the non-attending brother, if not his complete renouncing of the membership itself, may we cite the case 
of the grand jurisdiction of Pennsylvania, where except for the grand jurisdiction itself, there are no lines of demarcation, and a profane may choose the lodge with which he associates himself subject to the possession of fundamental character qualifications. The United Grand Lodge of England recognizes the desirability of this choice by the encouragement of class lodges. Many Latin jurisdictions practice this in permitting district grand lodges to operate in the language of the country of origin of foreign-born members. Should we? Would this not let the color question solve itself? Would it not prevent forcible integration under conditions distasteful to white and black alike, where each is a sincere thinking mason? We find a tactic acceptance of the principle of birds of a feather flocking together in the encouragement of research lodges for the students of masonry in associations of grand jurisdictions with like problems. Witness our RMMC, we might do well to approve lodges formed on the basis of creed, color, occupation, and environmental conditions. In other words, class. Um, should we demand proficiency in ritual? which is more desirable, masonry of the head or masonry of the heart. How many brothers of the craft absent themselves for fear of ridicule by those who meticulously demand that every password have a certain inflection, that every punctuation point be exactly placed, and that every piece of paraphernalia be regarded as sacrosanct? sanct? Should there not be a liberalism between jurisdictions, between lodges, and even between individual brothers which will recognize fundamental Masonic qualifications rather than superficial and artificial acquirements? We err in tolerance within our own ranks. Finally, should we not recognize the fact that circumstances alter cases and that a jurisdiction threatens threatened in its very existence by a numerically superior ruling force, must operate and concede privileges to preserve its very existence. Masonry must go underground in communist-controlled countries who would deny them the right to discuss politics or religion within the sanctity of their lodge. See, that's kind of written wrong. He's got a question mark at that. The first one's got a period. The first one was actually written in a question. This one's written in a statement, but it has a question mark at the end. So this guy's kind of losing me here with the, what's, where he's going with this, but we'll follow along. Where can they keep, uh, or where can they keep the holy fire, if not on the Masonic altar? What about domination of religious groups, such as we find in Spain, where Masonic membership is a comp accompanied with a decree of death pronounced by the Roman Church. Closer than that, in Colombia, South America, where assassination of heretics is condoned and encouraged by the domineering Church, can we forbid these Masons the sanctity of their lodges to discuss means of self-preservation? Question mark. And this should have had a period. So, ignore the pronunciations. Uh, uh, in this, uh, can we criticize justly our own jurisdiction, which does not open the floodgates, which will drown them out with the very water, which, if controlled, will be of great benefit to they de to the development of democratic thought and action? One could go on for time immeasurable with arguments for and against uniformity and universality of governing laws. The final law must be the answer to the question. Are we trying to fulfill God's will through masonry? Are we really promoting the brotherhood of man? Question mark, question mark. Proceedings of the 7th Rocky Mountain Masonic Conference, Rocky Mountain Consistory No. 2, Denver, Colorado, July 11th, 1958. That was when this was presented. Um, and again, just to top it off, it was presented by Harry W. Bundy, the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Colorado. And I thank you for joining me, folks. We'll be coming up with another one pretty right away because these are pretty short. So.